Welcome to Get Moving TV. I'm Dr. Chris Landon and I serve as your host. Uh, we're so uh, blessed to have the Ventura Adult Continuing Education here. But really, I'm a very Ventura-centric kind of person. Occasionally we expand throughout the county and we have so many jewels uh, lying uh, await uh, in Thousand Oaks, Simi Valley. Uh, and today we have Dr. Gerard Gibbons, a uh, digital storyteller. Uh, and I have a, a friend for years, uh, who's now your friend as well, uh, Porter Jordan, and we started uh, working on asthma and uh, uh, working on education in schools and writing grants and uh, getting programs going. And uh, he seemed to fall into your wheelhouse now. Uh, so tell us a little bit about how you can support someone like Porter Jordan and, and his journey, but also how you got to where you are. Uh, the, the whole idea of digital storytelling and being able to uh, change behavior. My own interest is in chronic disease and changing behavior in, in children with cystic fibrosis. They have a very complicated regimen. They don't manage to get it done. I put Bluetooth in there so, so I can have, uh, uh, have an idea of what they're doing. We uh, have the call at home. Uh, but I, I keep looking for what you seem to have found. Uh, so tell us about your journey and uh, uh, how, how you came, came into digital storytelling and doing such a much better job than myself. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, I came in uh, in the back door, so to speak. Uh, I, uh, I'm a product of California. I grew up in the deserts, Lancaster, actually, where I was born, and now reside in Thousand Oaks. Um, and, but my early days, I was impacted initially in my life through the power of story. Uh, much more first than anything else. It was actually had to do with the way that I got my name. Uh, my mom died when I was young, but she gave me my name before she died, hoping that uh, a Saint Gerard would, uh, would kind of uh, resuscitate me, if you will. I was given last rites, wasn't supposed to live. I was eight, eight weeks preemie, and, uh, and I made it. I'm here today. But that story of what she told me, how important it was for her to say that prayer to that saint, give me that name of that saint, stuck with me my entire life. I only heard the story once, and my mom died young, and I was always impressed how story moved me, and in my life, I've turned out, uh, I've discovered how much it really moves people in general. Number two, uh, not only can you hear a story once and uh, never forget it, uh, but everyone has a story, and so, as I moved forward and I grew up, uh, I decided to become a filmmaker to pursue uh, storytelling, so to speak. Um, and I got my degree. I went to Loyola Marymount University, right here locally in LA, and, uh, and promptly came out not having any clue as how I was to use that degree. You know, we come through those phases in our life and we don't know how we're going to apply what we just did. Uh, and I went through a life change uh, and found myself in healthcare. And uh, interestingly enough, became an eye doctor. And I, probably the similarity was uh, cinemato cinematography had something to do with the eye. So I gravitated to what I thought would be a real job and pursued medicine. What I did not know, and of course, a lot of people were surprised by bringing together these two disparate fields. What did filmmaking and healthcare have to do with each other? And at that time, I didn't know. So serendipitously, I walked in and discovered when I went to medical school, bam, they clicked. And suddenly I realized the unmet need, and that was patients, physicians, and industry all needed a way to communicate. And they weren't doing a very good job with each other. And you know what I'm talking about. The history of physicians speaking to patients has not been a glamorous one in the last 100 years. Uh, our, a lot of our patient skills, patient communication skills have eroded. Industry didn't know how to talk the languages of the patient or the practitioner. And there I was at my nexus. I'm a doctor, I've got a film degree, and I earned my way through uh, medical school uh, producing educational films for not only the industry and the profession, but patient education. And it was at that moment I realized that was my calling. And sometimes you don't know until you get there. And the key thing is to be open when that opportunity happens. And that's where it started. Uh, and then I had a lifelong journey from then, but which I'd love to tell you about. Well, uh, certainly, when I went to USC for medical school, we uh, did get videotaped during our, they put white coats on us in our very first weeks. 
uh, because this whole uh, being a doctor and being a shaman and all that and healing and learning how to heal and listen to people and the body language that went into it and watching, watching ourselves uh, uh, and, and feeding that back. Now I have a computer sitting in front of me and I'm just busy typing away. And uh, so it's a, I, I'm very curious about how you're meeting that challenge where we have, have so much technology not helping us with patients, but standing in the way of, of the healing uh, that can occur with a, a good doctor-patient relationship. Especially today. You know, I think healthcare as it's evolved has been a real uh, burden on the physician uh, because not only do we have to stick our faces in medical in devices and fill out our EHR, our electronic health care information, uh, you know, look, we have, uh, I'm going to come around to addressing uh, what we need to change, what I believe would help us. As physicians, health care has changed so much that we have less time to spend with the patient. Of course, that's been the case for many years. But the time we're spending, 70% of the time is spent in devices filling in information from the interaction with the patient. That's just crazy. Not only is the patient getting robbed, right? Patient's not getting the one-on-one -on -one time. They want the relationship. They don't give a damn about the data, excuse me, but they don't. Patients don't care about the data. Quite frankly, the patient wants to have the re interaction and the rapport with the physician. But unfortunately, the physician has to spend the time in the devices filling out stuff so they get re reimbursed. You know, you know the drill. It's your life, right? <laughs> so what can we do to facilitate um, compliance, adherence, rapport uh, when we have those few, min few minutes and few moments with the patients? S bringing storytelling to part of that interaction with the patient could go a long way in helping. So how do you go uh, uh, about uh, uh, doing that? Certainly I find myself telling about uh, uh, how my daughter, who is now 34, uh, sorry Jess, uh, uh, how something happened at 18 months with her and, and, and uh, what happened at five years with her and 10 years with her and trying to relate uh, that, that I am human and I have children and I I know everything there is up to age 34. I have no idea what happens to your daughter after that, but I'll learn, uh, and we learn we learn with them. And so I try and try and make that that connection. I'm, sometimes I wonder if they just think I'm just spouting off about myself there when really I am trying to tell them a story. So how do you can go about constructing uh, that emotive kind of storytelling that will help someone to be compliant or well, adherent? Well, in fact, and emotive storytelling is the concept. Uh, I'm at, I have a website called emotivestorytelling.com, actually, that serves just that purpose or helps educate physicians and consumers how important storytelling is in their interaction. Um, and before I go to how I do that, I think the, the problem is the healthcare culture has changed. Uh, if you think about the information we get when we're in medical school, and this is true of all professions, corporate, business, law, and medicine. There's a lot of rational, rational thinking, a lot of data that flies through the heads of practitioners. Okay, it's, it's natural, just a due course of study. You know, we're programmed to think rationally. Most of us are cognitives. We think, you know, uh, with data is king, if you will. Unfortunately, only 10% of people are cognitives. Most of us are emotives. We need to hear it emotively so it means something to us because uh, though uh, medicine and the disciplines, healthcare and business and law, for instance, are data driven, information driven, consumers by and large are not. They're emotive driven. They need to feel it. They need the meaning before the detail. And classically, what happens is doctors, lawyers, business overall tends to give the data first and forget about the meaning. But we need meaning before detail. That's how the human mind works. Why? Because we're not logic processors. We are story processors. So if we can become good as physicians at telling a story, it could be a 60-second story. It could be 45 seconds. Prescribe a story to your patients about the impact and implication, and you'll go a lot further. Um, so what I discovered on, for the years of, of producing for the Department of Defense, uh, the Veterans Affairs, uh, military health system and large corporate entities was that were trying to engage patients uh, and industry as well as practitioners is that 
the consumer was being left behind. They didn't understand because we have actually have a health literacy problem today. And you know, because I know you're a champion of adherence and compliance, well, how can we get people to adhere and comply when they don't understand the data that's coming at them? There's, according to the Surgeon General, we've got 90% of people do not understand the health information that's coming to them. Pamphlets, brochures, websites, even the apps and devices, they just clog a person's mind. You know, most people, and I, you've probably seen this in your career, you know, I would venture most patients, by the time they leave your office, forgot 90% of what you said by the time they start the engine in their car. They don't remember it. Yeah, and throwing away the prescription in the, in the trash can. Have you, the, have you, have you, have oh, you? Oh, certainly, yeah. It, that's a big issue, isn't it? So, uh, so, so how do we get around how that? Do we, you know, how do we get around that? I've got my 45 seconds. Okay. Uh, so, so rather than giving, telling a patient what to do and give them their regimen and their protocol and their pills, though they may need some of that, uh, is to tell them a story of consequence about a patient you had that went well and if you need to, maybe one that didn't go so well. It could be anonymous, it could be made up. You can make it up if you need to. But when people see the consequence of what it means to not follow the regimen, not stay on the diet, not take their pill, not stay off the stuff. Uh, if they don't see the consequence, if they don't see the meaning, and all they get is the detail of what's gonna happen, they'll fall right back into it. That's a behavior change problem, right? So if you told a short story of your patient, Susie, who actually realized that if she didn't follow a regimen and didn't knock the weight down and didn't get her health improved, she wasn't going to see and watch her grandchild grow up, or at least be able to interact and play with her. Suddenly, it can mean something. And, or worst case scenario, somebody who, uh, you could have pa positive patient examples that you've seen in your practice where people followed it and it made a huge difference in their life. And it could be their story, it doesn't even need to be yours, other than you observed it. Does that, does that resonate? Yes, I, you know, as you've been brought before, I mean, we have as it's doctors, we have the basic science circle, and then we have the clinical science circle, and we've been missing this uh, this this piece, or we've lost that piece, uh, and the, we're in the middle of this app taking over for all that, and, and we're actually looking at, can we prescribe apps, and, and will there be a good outcome if I prescribe this app, and this app goes with this device, and how, how can I uh, complete that? And one of the things that's, uh, happened or we're looking at with Robert Woods Johnson is co-managed care where the patient comes to us with what they really care about. Uh, I'm a pediatric pulmonologist and when my cystic fibrosis clinic is there, I know that they need to be taking their enzymes and their antibiotics and doing their airway clearance therapy and they hear the same thing over and over again and they shut that right off. If they come to me and say, I'm worried about my uncle has prostate cancer and you never talk to me about my sexual health, which I'm not gonna think about doing, then it becomes their visit. And, but the, and the, the one thing that we do get from these electronic healthcare records, or we will in the future, is the past, which is all the labs in one place without me having to go to 50 different results right. review. And then, and then finally that triptych ends with uh, maybe a prescription of this emotive storytelling or the right app or, but, uh, so the, but the other eventually, hopefully we'll get to is how do you instill emotive storytelling into these apps, into these times when you're not there, so. That's, that's a great question and a great thing to ask for, uh, for how. Well, the beautiful thing about mobile devices is that you can tell great stories on them. So, you know, I can use my phone and have the video play for, it doesn't have to be your video, it could be a video that you've either captured or had produced or get off the internet that makes your point in 60 seconds because Lord knows you don't have that much time, right? And, and suddenly, uh, here's an example. It could be someone's testimonial. Uh, you know, it's, I started off talking to you about how I was moved when I was young by a story that I never forgot from my mother, okay? But there's another thing that happens. Storytelling saves lives and in this way. Why does, this, why does storytelling save lives? Because it gets to the emotive center of the person. We're all familiar with Alcoholics Anonymous. What is Alcoholics Anonymous really? It's a storytelling approach to healing. Pure said, if you said it done, put Alcoholics Anonymous in a box and it does, it's one of the most successful therapeutic programs ever devised by man. And it works because it's a storytelling model. 
When you get up and say, hi, I'm Gerard, I'm an alcoholic, you're reminding yourself of the story of where you came, and you're spreading that story to others who need to hear it. Even if they've heard it 100 times, we all need to hear the story over again. How many that's the beautiful thing about story, even though you can hear it once and never forget. You don't mind hearing it again, because we do forget, right? So, so but how do, you, how do you take that model, a uh, person-to-person, face-to-face model, which is classically what most healthcare is, uh, until tele- telemedicine makes it better. Mm-hmm. And it's classically what psychology has been, face-to-face, right? Talk therapy. And does talk therapy work? Yeah, certainly better than uh, most. Uh, certainly better than most. Most uh, drugs do nowadays. It's certainly yes. better than most drugs, absolutely. And be- in part because stories get told within that interaction. But the problem, and, and case studies from Yale and other uh, noted universities have discovered that the one-to-one format certainly in psychology, and I think it's true in medicine, is not nearly as effective as it needs to be to cover all those people that need to be covered. Would you agree with that? It, yes. Okay. So, so how can you do that? You need to bring in storytelling strategies, and you can do that electronically. You can, uh, you can tell a great story. Uh, you know, people say, well, how, how much time does it take a great story? Uh, I go, well, people sit for a great movie for two hours, if you want that as an example. But you can do a powerful impact or blast of a story in 50, 45, 30 seconds. You watch commercials that do that all the time. So how can you take those two uh, dimensions, take stories, which today we're blessed to be in a media culture, okay? We're on the presence of a set. We're telling the stories with each other. But we need to be telling stories of consequence, short, powerful stories of consequence and relevance to the patient that makes them go, Oh my God, I'm not the only person going through this, which is basically what AA does, right? So we embed those stories in the apps through the healthcare system on your iPad so people can hear from other people and their stories who tell either how they made it out or how they didn't make it out. Sometimes we get moved uh, more deeply by things that didn't go right. Would you, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yes. So, you know, because we've tried lots of, lots of different approaches. We have something called Care Message, where people get a message on their phone three times a week with basic information. And uh, we've tried motivational interviewing, where we, uh, we make certain it's just uh, something that's your, uh, your goal. Uh, we have, uh, in this studio, we filmed a one-hour special on chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and put it up on YouTube, and, uh, and doctors would get paid to watch it. Nobody watched it. Okay, so we broke it into 10-minute segments. Uh, I got three people to watch it, uh, and so uh, uh, finally we put on a little USB stick So because there's no time at all left when you're a doctor to sit there for an hour and do anything, even though they would get $599 for, there's just too much time. Right. Uh, and so I went to their medical directors, and I said, okay, you know, do, do I buy them a Starbucks card to watch this 10-minute video? And they go, oh, we're sick of Starbucks cards. Uh, well, you know, how much money did they pay to download that kind of movie last night? Oh, well, so I told this at the uh, CMS, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and uh, 200 people were Facebooking in the audience and I said, yes, we had to, you know, we're really looking, maybe cat videos is what's going to do it. I don't know how to get people to, to watch for more than a minute uh, anymore. So, so that's, right. how do you get people to, get, you're getting that information across in a minute or getting them to watch longer? Uh, they have to be real. They have to be authentic. They can be crisp and short. If you talk to somebody who's been through a trauma, uh, I've had the good fortune of working with the Department of Defense for 25 years, uh, especially centered on mental health impacting our veterans, service members, and their families. And boy, you want to get moved by, uh, I'll tell you a specific example of where stories work and how they can work here, even if they're short format, even if they're under a minute. You know, classically, we have an underserved mental health system in this country. It's probably the big elephant in the room in terms of health care, as far as uh, my opinion. Just not treated well, not, uh, not addressed properly, and primarily because our interventions are old-fashioned. They haven't really modified uh, uh, in, in years. And in some respects, the scale of the problem has increased. 
So how do we counteract a lot of health care issues? Not just with the Department of Defense, but just you know, garden variety health care issues, which are on almost every house in America if, on some level or another. Uh, you need to devise a way to get people exposed to hearing other people who have their problem either successfully navigate out of the problem or have solved it. And it doesn't take a long time to get that because people who relate to uh, see people who've run through their course, there's an, instrument, there's an intimate validity, an authentication that happens, a face validation, if you will. So for instance, for the Department of Defense, for vets, especially those, and I've worked with many who have been frequently deployed, uh, they, they get uh, kind of badly damaged on the psychological side. And they are very hesitant to share. Matter of fact, they're closed off. Service members and veterans are somewhat closed off anyway just because of their regimen and their ethos. They don't like to talk a lot about this stuff. And they're certainly not going to talk about it with their normal physician or their next door neighbor. And they barely talk about it with themselves, even when they're in peers. But when they do share, and one of the most powerful storytelling methodologies I helped develop with the VA is using storytelling principles that help stories be shared personally in groups or over the internet, web-based, about people who might have PTSD or suicidal tendency or uh, subject to depression. And, and once they realize it's another service member who's been frequently employed like them and they got out of their mess because they heard just enough of the story that said, wait a minute, this person's real, then they can get drawn in, drawn in by themselves. They can do that in the privacy of their, their own home in the darkness, if you will, with a phone. That, and by listening to a fellow service member explain the trauma they went through and the fears they faced and what they had to do to go through to finally navigate to wellness, they, there's a bond that occurred, whether they're in front of them or not. And, and that can take just a few minutes where somebody says, oh my God, that's me. How did they get out? And they'll listen further. What did they do next? Oh my God, maybe I should do that too. See what I'm saying? So by making stories relatable and meaningful, whether it's you telling a, a patient about a successful patient you know named Susie who navigated out of her health condition because she finally found meaning as to why she did, in the same way, uh, a service member who, has P who had PTSD is now getting treatment can express to another service member who's closed off that you know what, this may be more serious than you think, and you need to seek talk therapy with the therapist. And those little things can happen without much interaction from the healthcare field until that person's ready to seek that help. So, and that can take 60 seconds, it may take five minutes. If it's compelling, they'll sit there as long as it's compelling. So that's the key thing, make stories compelling. Otherwise, you're wasting uh, time. So uh, how do you go about making a story compelling? We, we, we were working on an app for the VA, and they, en they ended up closing the request for proposals uh, while we were in the middle of it. And it was uh, through GPS. I would mm -hmm. know if you're within range of a gun range. I would know what message you were, what you were uh, uh, receiving, uh, what your bank account was, uh, what it looked like your dating pattern was, uh, your proximity to a liquor store. And uh, we could send out messages uh, uh, to work on that, no emotive storytelling, no uh, no miniature videos, so I can see where that would uh, link together. But they uh, suddenly interest seemed to go away from PTSD. We have a another producer in uh, uh, Colorado, uh, Stefan Tubbs, who has a radio show and did a radio interview, and he did a movie called Acronym uh, for PTSD. That it's this, instead of calling it PTSD, just it's, it's an acronym. Uh, but it's two hours of these stories. And we tried showing it to the families. And the family, oh, this is too long. Ah, this is too boring. And it really followed five people who looked normal through their journey as they broke down and how fishing or uh, making bicycle or what, something that, that uh, helped them through that journey. So I'm very, this approach is, is uh, very interesting to me, how, you, how do you know when to give it to them? How do you feed them uh, they need uh, to be properly. I think they need to be self-fed, meaning it needs to be so good that people will feed themselves. Uh, I, I developed a program for, uh, called afterdeployment.org for the Defense Center of Excellence for Psychological Health. And that program, which was military health system based, Department of Defense based, I worked with the psychologist and the whole team of experts up in uh, at Fort Lewis uh, 
uh, Joint Base Lewis, uh, Lewis McCord up in uh, Washington. And it's a DOD effort, Department of Defense. It was the idea was bringing uh, cognitive teaching, but also a mode of teaching over the web that service members could, could access. And in that case, you have to make the stories sticky. I call them sticky. They have to be something that's compelling and sticky. So you do that, and they can be short. And they have to be good enough that make people want to go further based upon the merit of the content themselves. Well, as, as we uh, come up towards the end of the show here, is the, the, we'll have websites uh, running underneath and, and in the credits and like. Are any of these things available uh, on YouTube or where we could, uh, uh, TED Talk, uh, something where we can get an idea about, uh, get our hands around it a little bit? Sure, I'd, lo I'd love to tell you about just a couple of quick. One is emotivestorytelling.com. Emotivestorytelling.com uh, has th background and research as well as videos that kind of explain what the principles that are being presented here, uh, as well as a Resilient Warrior Program, which is being set up to actually address uh, first responders and uh, and uh, service members treating F, uh, as a storytelling way to treat PTSD and other common health care issues. Uh, and another PBS project we're actually working on called Battles of the Mind, which are focused on these using the same storytelling principles for healing. And uh, looking forward to um, seeing this being more successful. It's actually gaining a lot of interest across, uh, across the nation as supplanting uh, public health and mental health solutions. So looking forward to that. Well, Dr. Gerard Gibbons, uh, what a blessing we have in Ventura, someone who uh, really uh, has, is devoting their life to uh, helping us to find a way uh, to decrease stress and integrate it into our modern Facebook messaging uh, world in a way that uh, Ventura, uh, it's time for you to take a look at those websites, think about the people in your lives. It's time for you to get moving.